Hello and welcome to week 4, part 3 of EGM 703, Principles of INSAR. In this lesson, we'll learn the basics of how we can use SAR data to measure topography and movement on the Earth's surface. As we've seen, the phase of a signal is the fraction of a, of a period, or the fraction of a full cycle or full wavelength, of that signal. In our example here, we see that between our sensor and our target, we have one, two, three full wavelengths, and then a small portion left over. The phase that is recorded by the sensor has two different components. The first is a deterministic component based on the range R between the sensor and the target. This is effectively the bit that's left over after we divide the range by the wavelength. The second component is the random component based on the contributions from all of the different subpixel scatterers, and this is the part that changes based on the surface conditions. Because phase is limited to be between 0 and 2 pi, or between minus pi and pi, the phase of an individual SAR image appears to be totally random, noise. There's a lot of information in there, including about the topography, but it's difficult to see without some additional processing. That additional processing is known as interferometric SAR or INSAR. The basic idea here is that we have two images, image 1 and image 2, that are separated either by a baseline distance b or separated by time. Then the phase of the first image is the combination of the deterministic component determined by the range and the random component uh, contributed by each of the subpixel scatterers. In the second image, the phase of the pixel is equal to the deterministic component determined by the range of the second image, which is just r plus this little delta r, which is the distance from where the perpendicular baseline intersects the sight line of the second satellite, and the random component that is contributed by the subpixel scatterers. If we then construct an interferogram by effectively differencing the phases of the two images, then what we're left with is the phase owing to that extra little distance between the two satellites, delta r. Of course, this only works if we have coherence between the two, image, the two images. That is, the random phase in image 1 is approximately equal to the random phase in image 2. If they're substantially different, then this doesn't quite work out. So, if we have two images, u1 and u2, the way that we form the interferogram is by taking the dot product of image 1 with the complex conjugate of image 2. So given image 1, which has an amplitude and phase that looks like this, and image 2, which has an amplitude and phase that looks like this, if we actually do this multiplication, what we end up with is this. And notice that the, what the phase of the interferogram looks like. Rather than the random noise, we have a very clear interference pattern. And if you've ever seen a thin film of oil on water or wet pavement, then you've seen a pattern like this before. So this image is what contains the information about the difference in range between the two images, which we can use to work out the topography or the ground motion that we're looking at. So even on flat terrain, the phase in an interferogram will vary from the near range to the far range. This is known as the flat earth phase. In order to see what we want to see, such as the topographic phase, or the deformation phase, then we need to correct this. In the example here, which is based on the images that we used in this week's practical, we see how removing the flat earth phase from the interferogram completely changes the picture. And what we're left with, at least in this case, is the combination of the ground displacement due to an earthquake and the phase due to the topography in the image. As previously mentioned, the assumption that the random phase components are approximately equal and therefore zero out when we form the interferogram 
depends on whether we have coherence between the two images. And another way to think about this is that the phase is time independent. That is, we can treat the different phase contributions of all of the different subpixel scatterers as stationary vectors and then add them together. By measuring the coherence between two images, we can learn about the accuracy of our measured topography or the estimated deformation or displacement. If we have high coherence, it means that we can trust the estimated elevation or displacement from our interferogram. If we have low coherence, it tends to mean that our estimates are less reliable. With shorter wavelengths, it tends to be harder to keep coherence between images. In the example here, anywhere that we have high coherence, we see the interferometric fringes. Anywhere that we see gray, we have low coherence. So this example shows uh, an interferogram derived from C-band radar, which has a wavelength of 5.6 centimeters. The wavelength down here, or the second image down here, is for an L-band radar, which has a wavelength closer to 25 centimeters. And you can see how much more complete the fringes are. It's, we have significantly better coverage of the interferogram uh, for the longer wavelength than we do for the shorter wavelength. So, what do we do if the ground is moving? Well, in that case, our interferometric phase has two different components related to the topography and the deformation. To isolate the deformation, if we only have two images, then we need an accurate external DEM in order to estimate the topographic phase and remove it, leaving only the deformation phase. If the topography is changing, or we don't have an accurate DEM available, then we can use three or more SAR images to accomplish the same thing. In this case, we would take one pair separated by a longer amount of time, for example, several days or weeks, in order to measure the deformation. A second pair separated by a shorter amount of time, but where the satellite paths are separated by some distance, will enable us to use enable us to estimate the topographic phase and subtract it from the interferometric phase of the first pair. This technique, where we subtract out the topographic phase in order to study displacement, is known as differential INSAR or just D-INSAR. So INSAR and D-INSAR are incredible, incredibly powerful tools, but they don't have unlimited power. For starters, with differential INSAR, we can only see deformation or displacement in the satellite's line of sight. If we want to see the 2D or 3D displacement field, then we need to have multiple look directions. Fortunately, SAR satellites do acquire in both ascending and descending orbits. For example, if we have a glacier here, just as an example, we would need a descending pass, where the satellite is typically traveling from northeast to southwest, and an ascending pass, where the satellite is moving from southeast to northwest. Unfortunately, we're not always lucky enough to have these passes acquired close together in time, which means we can't always get multiple looks in order to estimate the full displacement field. The surface also has to be coherent. In the example here, we can see nice, clear interferometric fringes on some areas of this glacier, but we also see very noisy fringes in other spots. If the motion is too slow, then the surface can end up decorrelating due to seasonal changes, and we can't actually measure any motion. Similarly, we can't measure very fast changes using differential INSAR because if the surface is moving quickly, it also ends up decorrelating. We're typically measured, or typically limited to measuring motion that is less than the sensor resolution in the time between images. We're also limited by the spatial baseline. The fringe density, so how close together these fringes are, increases as the baseline increases, meaning that if the images are too far apart, we end up with multiple fringes per pixel, and we end up being unable to measure anything. We also have to consider atmospheric effects. Small delays in the return time due to water vapor in the atmosphere or ionospheric influence actually change the phase measured by the sensor, sensor which makes it even more difficult to correlate the two images. And finally, we also need to worry about orbit errors. 
Part of the process requires that we know where the two satellites are at the time of acquisition. This is less of a problem for more modern satellite missions, but it can be a considerable issue for some of the older SAR satellites. So in this lesson, we've covered how SAR sensors record phase, which contains information about the distance to the target and the sub, the sub pixel scatterers. If we have at least two SAR images, we can create an interferogram to measure topography and deformation, though the accuracy of this technique depends on the level of coherence between the two images. With three or more SAR images, or two images plus an external DEM, we can subtract the topographic phase from our interferogram and measure the deformation or surface displacement between, displacement between the two images. In short, INSAR is a powerful technique that can provide highly accurate measurements of topography and motion, though like all things, it is not without its limitations. You can read more about the topics that we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lillisan, Kiefer, and Chipman, Chapter 6.9, or Campbell and Wynn, Chapter 7.12. I've linked here to an ESA training manual. This is a free ebook that covers the theory of INSAR in quite a bit of detail. There's also a video produced by Michigan Tech University that covers the concepts introduced in this lesson. And this paper by Baumler and Hartle also covers the theory of INSAR in quite a bit of mathematical detail, if that's something that you're interested in. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye.